Hello and welcome again to the Rider Review. This is Eric Karad Rider, and this week we're going to be taking a look back at the 2020 LGBT melodrama titled Supernova. Now, Supernova's runtime is one hour and 33 minutes long. It is directed by Harry McQueen. The script was written also by Harry McQueen. It is produced by Tristan Golliger and Emily Morgan. It is composed by Keaton Henson. The cinematography by the legendary Dick Pope. And it was edited by Chris Wyatt. And the stars of the movie are two veteran performers. I'm talking Colin Firth and Stanley Tucci. Also joining them is Pippa Haywood, uh, Peter McQueen, James Dreyfus, Ian Drysdale, and Sarah Woodward. Let's just face it, Colin Firth, in one of his best perform, Colin Firth is in one of his best performances since his Academy Award since his Academy Award performance in 2010's The King's Speech. In this movie, he stars as a concert pianist named Sam, embarking on a farewell tour to North England, along with his longtime companion named Tusker, played by Stanley Tucci. The companions are afraid that their relationship will be over soon, as Tusker a novelist, is battling the early stages of dementia. Sam feels it is necessary to take Tusker with him to see the sights, family, and friends before Tusker's dimension, dementia worsens. Now, as you all know, the movie, the genre they said for this movie is a romantic drama, which I actually think this is kind of a bit of a misnomer, according to according to critics. Yes, the movie is a LGBT themed movie, and you know I guess the reason why I chose this movie to this of this week is because you know the month of June is Pride Month, and even though I am not of the LGBT community, I still have respect for them. I don't have any judgments. I don't ca cast any kind of discriminations. When I see people, I try to do my best to respect those around in hopes that they respect me back. You don't have to worship the ground I walk on. But as long as we come to some kind of a mutual liking towards one another, that really actually is something that I would feel very, very grateful for. And uh, But the movie's top primary stuff is not really based off of the homosexual relationships between Sam and Tusker. But it's basically about, you know, Tusker battling the early stages of dementia and Sam, who is, you know, like, con contemplating of going to her one last concert pianist before, I guess, he's going to either take in his early retirement or he might probably take his career path towards a much more lighter, more low prolific stream of life, whatever it is they do, you know, I always hope for the best in whatever endeavors they wish to pro they wish to proceed in. Uh this the movie itself is more of a melodrama than it is as a romantic drama. Because, you know, we see Tusker, you know, even though the emphasis is not all the time they focus on his dementia, you know, there are times when Tusker does seem to weave in and out between being coherent and incoherent. But then again, I guess that's part of the symptoms of the early stages of dementia, 
But I know that a few months, maybe even a few years down the line, his coherency is going to get less and less. So he's still at the early stages, which means that, you know, he could still communicate. But his coherency and his cohesiveness towards his partner is starting to deteriorate. Maybe not as aggressively now, but it will soon get worse, unfortunately. I mean, there's no cure for dementia so this is not, you know, this fun, uplifting, spontaneous, gay, romantic tale. This is really sentimental in its delivery, unfortunately. I know some people will get turned off about it because of the fact that most people don't want to go to movies to watch sad melodramas. You all want to take your troubles away. You all want to go see movies that are more uplifting, more spontaneous. You, most people don't want to go to movies to get all sentimental and melancholy. And you know what? Perfectly understandable. I, I understand you completely. I mean, this movie is really not for entertainment, but more for... More close to the level of being inspired. Because it doesn't matter whether you're gay or straight or anything in between. Bi, I don't care. Because let's face it, it may not even necessarily be a lover who's battling dementia. I mean, it could probably, I mean, you could look at a, at a sibling who's battling dementia. You can look at a family member who's battling dementia. The dementia story is the top prop priority in this movie. It's not about really the gay romantic. I mean, it didn't have to necessarily be a gay couple in the story. But I think it just works well that way. And besides that, when you think about it, Colin Firth and Stanley Tucci in real life are not homosexuals. Or even lovers in real life. They are married. They have kids. And, uh, you know, I actually thought it was quite inspiring to see two heterosexual men playing gay characters. I know maybe people might pr probably thought, why didn't they actually get real gay actors to play these characters? Well, that's because, like I told you before... The homosexual angle is not the top priority. It's the it's the dementia angle that's really, really the one that gets hammered in more. That's the top priority. Everything else is secondary. The road trip is secondary. The the little family social, the little party, I guess that too is 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 secondary and the climax the climax in this story is really 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 nail pounding i mean it really drives the wedge into your heart and i'm going to get more into that as we go along so under the direction of Harry McQueen, Supernova is a heartwarming, epic love story with a dramatic situation that both lovers suffer greatly, with one battling an incurable disease and the other who has to face the reality that their time together is, is borrowed. That's right, they're on borrowed time with each other. They know that... This is their last time together. Whether Tusker is going to go on to live the rest of his life battling dementia, a disease that gets worse as the years go by. Both of them know that they're at the last stages of their relationship. 
I mean, you know, I mean, sure, the memories will always be there, well, at least for Sam. You know, I'm not cracking jokes about Tusker because I, I don't. I'm, I'm not going to do that. I I know what it feels like when people have dementia. It's not a pleasant thing. I I I, I totally totally understand. I mean, it's just heartbreaking to see what these people are struggling through. And, you know, when it comes to a person battling dementia, it's not just the person who's suffering, but the other person, too, might be suffering because... It's, I mean, if, 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 he, if Tusker decides to go on with his life, just having his lover be a witness to his declining health, well, that's also going to take a bit of a big toll on him as well. It's not just the person who's suffering, but the person who is with him that's suffering too. Okay, there's no winner here. The way McQueen directed and wrote the script is very well handled and nuanced, and it tackles the issue of dementia in a sensitive and professional manner. At least I'll say one thing about the way how Harry McQueen dealt with the dementia thing. I mean, many people sometimes have this whole misconception that people who suffer from dementia do all kinds of wild, wacky, crazy, unhinged, insane antics. Well, that is totally all not true. I mean, you know, as time goes on, maybe people will end up losing their speech, losing their capabilities to perform the simpler tasks. But at least they don't do it in such an over-the-top, silly, goofy ways. You know, at least I'll say that. At least we'll say it was handled in a mature perspective and not, you know, like, like some silly, goofy, cartoony stuff. There is no room for goofy silliness in this movie. This is a, a straightforward... Heart-wrenching, heartbreaking tale. And you kind of have to be pretty serious about these kind of things. Not all movies are going to put a smile to your face. And you know what? That's fine. You know, I think the main thing about going to a movies is not always to come out with a smile on your face. But a reaction. An emotion. And you could be happy. You could be sad. You could be proud. You could be mad. And I think that if you come out of a theater with a reaction. Then I guess the director. And whoever was. Whoever worked on the movie. Can all be proud of themselves. So though our main character is a pianist and the other one is a writer, which kind of is a little uh, stereotyped. And I don't necessarily mean that in a bad way. Um, it's, it's just that they always seem to want to make gay characters... Into some level of performances. In this case we have an author. And a pianist. And that's fine. You know I'm not complaining. But it's just that. Why does it they always want to make LGBT characters successes? I mean I'm not likely to see failures. But you know. When will we ever have a gay character. Who's uh, I don't know. Something not so spectacular of a job, like uh, like a ditch digger. Or maybe he's some schmo at a box factory. Hey, it still pays. It's a job. But, you know, like I said, that's a minor quibble. I'm not going to go to that much deep. 
Now, even though they have two contrary professions, they do share something in common. Aside from being in love with each other for a long, long time, astronomy seems to be something of their interest. And it comes into effect as each note is played on the piano, the more it manipulates the stars in the sky as one gets brighter and winks back at you. Usually when you see a star that gets brighter and winks back at you, well, there is a, there was a saying goes that when you die, you come back as a star. Now, I guess this could be a sign that maybe our main, one of our main protagonists, well, there is protagonists, and there's really no antagonist or villain in the story, which is a nice thing, too. I mean, people see them walking into a store and nobody smears homophobia at them, which is nice and refreshing. But then again, but then again, since the two leading characters are heterosexual and seem to look and act more heterosexual than LGBT, hey, they look moderate, so nobody will even know the difference. It could be almost like a co-worker taking his friend to lunch. Talk about the bills they have to pay for their lawnmower. But no, no, no. I mean, that's one of the things. I'm glad that actually they did hire straight actors to play gay characters. So at least they're not being stereotyped or cliched or even made to look, you know, limp-wristed, effeminate, or, or one character who is playing the man and the other one's playing the woman. No. In some ways, that kind of defies what homosexual relationships are about. Isn't homosexual relationships to be about two people from the same genders who fall in love? Well, I just don't understand why one, like in some gay relationships, one wants to be the man, the other wants to be a woman. That doesn't make any sense. I mean, if you want a man... If you're straight, if you're gay and you want a woman, then maybe it should be your choice to find a woman. It would make no difference. You don't have to transform into... into a female. No. Because th that defies the logic of homosexuality. It's about to... Lovers from the same gender who love each other. That's what it is. If you go against the grain, then you're defying your own logic. And that kind of makes you hypocritical now, doesn't it? And I'm glad that they actually had straight guys playing gay characters, so at least you don't get stereotyped. At least they're not like effeminate, girly type guys. And I know, I know, that sounds a bit cruel. I'm, and I don't mean it in a bad way. Bad way. I'm going to try and put a closure to this. Let's just face it. They, they did it just so that nobody gets offended. And they're doing their best to play it safe. Because, you know, they would probably end up getting negative backlash if they actually start acting like caricatured stereotypes. And so, yeah, and even though one is suffering an illness that is no cure, their love is stronger than ever. And when death parts ways with them, their love will linger on from the stars above. So, yes, astronomy does play its part. I mean, sometimes I think that if you look up in the sky and you see a loved one and a star twinkles in, twinkles in front of you, think about it. It might be a dead 
relative. It could be an old friend. It could be somebody who you genuinely cared for, winking back at you, telling you, telling you everything's all right. You know, because in this movie, I kind of have to do my best to sort of speak comfort. And also, I want to try and not offend anybody in particular. And sure, the movie is not always that subtle. And it is heavily saturated with symbolism. But Supernova basks in keeping things delicate. And it never meanders off its narrative. And keeps it brief in a movie and straight to the point in a movie that lasts just a little under 95 minutes long. That's what I liked about this movie, too. The, the script was crisp. It went straight to the point. Yes, I know it's spelled indie film written all over it. I, I understand that perfectly. I mean, this movie did run on a shoestring budget. No arguments there. Not, at least not from me. You're not going to get any arguments from me on that, on that perspective. Otherwise, we'd probably have a big all-star cast, but there's no need for that. I mean, yeah, we have dependable actors like Colin Firth and Stanley Tucci. And though they're not necessarily, well, Colin Firth, well, I am not going to call him an A-lister, but I'm not going to call him a B-movie star. He... I guess he's an A-lister. I mean, he did win an Oscar. So I guess that does make him an A-lister. But he's not like a mega, mega superstar. Same could be said for Stanley Tucci. They've done a lot of good things. They've been in a lot of great performances over their careers. But they're not, you know, like Hollywood elites. No, they're not. Besides that, Colin Firth is from Britain and spends a lot of his movies located in his merry old English country. Sometimes they, he, he goes to Ireland. And that's fine. Stanley Tucci, you know, he's that international star. Uh, even though the movie is set in England, in the Lake District, Tusker's character... Well, I... Guess he's supposed to be playing British, even though he never really actually fully utilizes his accent. I mean, even in this movie, he doesn't even conceal it by even trying to attempt at a British accent. He sounds American because, well, he is American. He's he's Italian American to be specific. But yeah, yeah. I mean, it it. The direction and the script really just keep things to the point. Uh, there are some memorable scenes that really show the deterioration of Tusker. Including a scary scene where Tusker wanders off and Sam has to go out looking for him. Fortunately, fortunately he did find him. And this was at the beginning of the movie. There are some other heartbreaking scenes where there were times when... Tusker would repeat things he would say over and over again. Sometimes I even, and sometimes even I have that kind of problem too. Sometimes I do admit that I might say something and repeat, but that's because maybe sometimes I'm caught off guard. Because sometimes I wonder if I if if I said it before and if, uh, and then sometimes I might repeat myself. I have caught myself doing that too, and I'm not. I don't have dementia, but. You know, people do forget things. People sometimes might get lost in the crowd or might be, like, forgetful at times, you know. Okay. Oh, shit. Uh... Where am I? Okay. So, in his performance as Sam, Colin Firth definitely throw, turns in an Oscar-caliber performance as we truly take pity on this man, as he's faced with the fact that he and his lover are at the end of the road in their relationship. 
So, you know, this whole road trip, I mean, I, okay, I didn't think it was Sam's idea. It was more Tusker's idea for him to, like, go to one more concert piano was before his, before, and to, before, you know, Sam decides to either retire or probably just, you know, end up taking a private tutoring course in his apartment or something. I don't know. But you do feel generally bad for him as being the... Being the, uh... The... Being the main cog in the relationship. Being the fact that... You know... Even though he's not the one who's suffering... But we could still feel that... He and his lover are at the end of the road of their relationship... But their relationship stays strong throughout as he guides his lover, Tusker, through the difficult stages of getting on in age. I mean, they're both playing, you know, old school gay men. So we're not looking at these young hip guys with their man buns and their... And their colorful attires. No. Nothing like that at all. These are old guys. These guys are older than me. And I'm 45 years old. These guys are pretty much maybe like in their late 50s. Mid to late 50s. Maybe even pushing 60. So these are like from the old school era. So maybe this movie is not hip. For modern day approval. So he guides his lover Tusker through the difficult stages of getting on in age. And watching his friend's health fade out. Like for example, you know, like the time they were at the convenience store and he wandered off. And Tusker wandered off and Sam tried to look for him. There's also times when... Tusker would be seen writing in a journal. And at the beginning, you know, he seems to be writing fine. But then throughout th this journal, he starts to write a lot of... I don't know. I, I don't want to use the words like gobbledygook. And I definitely do not want to say he, what he was writing was... Was was bullshit because that would not be fair and that would not be very nice. Come on now, he's 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 suffering, so it's not bullshit or godly gook. But let's just say we could tell that his writing has become somewhat incongruent. It was, you could tell that this is a sign of, a, and there are, like I said, there are times when he would repeat things over, and sometimes he would forget his trains of thoughts at times, which is some of the more subtle effects of having dementia. I'm glad that they actually made it off so he doesn't look like a one-note joke here. I mean, they all are very, both of them are very, very authentic in their performances. It's like, almost like real people. This is not, you know, Stanley Tucci being Stanley Tucci or Colin Firth being Colin Firth. These are two genuinely real characters that makes you think these guys are for real. Tucci is equally poignant as Tusker, whose health may be on the decline, but we can still but he can still remain cohesive with Sam. And can still deliver lines of compassion and comfort to Sam during these difficult times. 
And uh, to say that neither of these, and yes, there are going to be scenes where Sam and Tusker are going to be sleeping in the same bed. But at least we'll say one thing that Colin Firth and Stanley Tucci had said. They both agreed that they were going to play these roles. And, and you know, they both said that if I was to actually go to sleep with another guy or sleep in, a, in, a, in, in, a, in another guy's bed, it would be both of them. They both said that. Though conventionally, they're even though they're both straight at straight guys. This was actually the the third time that they have collaborated with each other. The first was in two thousand one, called Conspiracy, and in two thousand twelve, they starred in a movie called Gambit. So it's natural that they have great chemistry. And though they're both straight actors playing LGBT or whatever letters were missing in the alphabet soup, they seem to find sharing the sheets with one another. But then again, I would have said the same thing too with if it was the case of anybody. Man, woman, or whatnot. So while Sam takes Tusker with him on his camping van, we get to see the tantalizing view of the English countryside thanks to the amazing cinematography by Dick Pope. The, the background was gorgeous. Very picturesque. The road trip plays a pivotal role for the long road ahead for both leads because this is the road they will enter and the road they can't turn back. Which of course leads to the inevitable climax. Which I'm going to discuss right now. Okay, so. While in the middle of the party. Sam goes back to their little RV camper. He peruses through Sam's writings. Which is turning out to be less and less coherent. Then he approaches a box, and inside the box was some old school cassettes with a recording in it. Yes, they, even though it's not a period piece, it's set in modern times. But with the exception of a GPS, these guys seem to depend heavily on old school technology, like Cassette players. They still have those? <laughs> well, I guess... I guess if you have some lying loose and lying around, so be it. He records them a message, kind of like a bit of a farewell. You know. And he also has... A pill... A pill capsule... Filled with some dangerous, heavy-duty drugs. Something like barbiturals, I think that's what it was. I'm no pharmacy, but I do know... But I think what I do know is that it's a very heavy-duty drug. And if you take too many of those, it slows down the systems inside of you. To the point where... Well, let's just say it's like the bullet in a capsule, although less messy. I mean, sure, he could have took a took a blow to the brain or a stab in the heart, but I guess that would be too messy. And I should really be shame on me for telling these jokes because this is not a funny movie. And yet, here I am sitting down here cracking jokes. When I shouldn't. I could crack jokes for for next week's movie. Even though the next movie I'm going to be reviewing is a horror film. But I think you could still actually can find some room for jokes. Even though you know next week's movie I'm reviewing is The Empty Man. So that one oh, has funny moments. Some, but not too many. But, uh, you know, uh, on the other hand, this is a very serious, sentimental movie. And I shouldn't be telling jokes about 
how he plans to kill himself. Of course, you know, Sam is not happy with the whole idea that Tusker's been keeping this behind his back, this whole road trip, this whole family gathering. This was all a setup. His last concert piano wants him to request for a song in his honor. <sighs> I'm going to say this did really tug at the heartstrings. It was very emotional. You could see Sam being not exactly very pleased with Tusker's decision to take his life away. But he's not like... Com he's, he's like a combination between... Angry, sad, confused, perfectly understandable. I feel your pain. You know? And But then Tusker explains to him that... I want to be... If I'm going to be in a relationship with you for the rest of my life, I want to be the real me. And what does he mean by the real me? Well, once his health starts to decline, there's not going to be much left of him. He's just going to fade out and fade out and fade out. There is no cure for dementia. Once you get, once it gets you, there's no turning back. I'm sorry to say. He wants a lover. He does not want a designated nurse. He wants to be in a relationship where both him and his lover are two independent individuals. Not one just pretending to be like a nurse to him. So by doing this suicidal thing, he's giving him his freedom. His freedom to continue living his life. Even though it's not going to be with him anymore. And it's not going to be the same. But I'd rather die happy with you around than to die really without you. So then they come to an agreement. He does his final piano recital. It's unknown if whether or not Tusker actually goes with the suicide. But I began to think that maybe this is possibility. One of the things I also like about this movie is that Colin Firth actually looks like he's genuinely playing the piano. And seems to be right on tact with the keys. Which makes me think Colin Firth must have did some level of piano lessons before taking on this role. Like I said before too, Tusker does have his levels of coherency, but the signs of symptoms of dementia are still taking quite an effect on his health. There are times when Tusker might forget things quite frequently and might even show some signs of disorientation. Also, he loses some of his words and doesn't remember his bearings, but the scariest part is that it only happens in small fragments of the movie. Which is quite good because you don't want to watch an entire movie of some man's health deteriorating. You know, that's still going on with this journey. Tucker's dementia conceal Tusker's dementia is concealed throughout, and he is still functioning well, but we must remind ourselves that this is only the early stages of his disease. Plus, he's doing it for Sam so that the journeys end is not a sentimental one. But it was just unfortunate that Sam caught his journal, which, which is heartbreaking. Sam, like Tusker, feels the effects of aging as he makes the effort to perform a farewell concert, a comeback for him after spending many years away from the public spotlight. So while the pair argue over satellite navigation, they stop off at Sam's sister, Pl Lily, played by Pippa Haywood. And they get together with the family. 
that was a surprise that she and Tusker arranged. And now it feels like a joyous occasion until Sam opens a box and strikes a fatal blow to Sam's heart very badly. You know, like I said, the tape and the barbiturates that Tusker wishes to perform on himself as a suicide. And sure, the chemistry between Firth and Tucci are met with witty dialogue, general respect and comfort for both men and for each other. On a more subtle side to their chemistry, the expressions and body language they express speaks louder volumes as each share the joys of being together while also aware that their time is drawing near. Supernova remains subtle throughout by not making it too much about them being a gay couple or the fact that it doesn't overly makes us tear up during Tusker's battle with dementia or the general struggles both men face when it comes to their aging. It's about creating a memory, one that will last for the rest of their lives. The quiet nature is delivered with compassion and eloquence and is a sign of true love that two people have for each other and that nothing can or ever will stand in their way of true love that will never die even after we leave this earth. So when all is said and done, if I was to give this movie a scale out of 10, I would give Supernova from 2020 a 9 out of 10. So I guess this ends my writer review. Thank you all for listening in. If you wish to subscribe to my YouTube channel, please feel free to do so. If you wish to leave a comment, go right ahead. But just remember the three simple rules. Be kind, be courteous, and please refrain from any rude comments. And I will be back again with another movie review. So until next time, this is Eric Rutwriter saying... Keep watching those movies, and I'll see you around. Goodbye.